Uh, so today we will continue uh, discussing CPU scheduling algorithm. Uh, in the previous lecture, we covered some basic scheduling algorithms, including first come, first serve, shortest job first, and what else? Round robin. Round robin, and Priority. Priority. So these are the basic algorithms. Now, a real operating system doesn't implement, doesn't take one of these algorithms and implement it. A real operating system implements a combination of these, as we will see in today's lecture. So in today's lecture, we will see how a real operating system implements a combination, uses a combination of these processes. <coughs> so how does it how does it do that? Well, usually there uh, in a real operating system uh, there are multiple levels in uh, multiple levels of priority. So uh, the multi-level queue uh, idea is something is an idea that is implemented in real operating systems where the system has uh, multiple levels of priority. Uh, one example, uh, you know, the first, uh, the highest level or the higher level uh, of priority may have foreground processes or interactive processes. The lower level may have the background processes or the batch processes. So interactive processes are the processes that interact with the user. Batch processes are processes that execute uh, longer tasks without interacting with the user. Like uh, you know, downloading something, uh, downloading a big file from the internet, or doing some uh, image processing type of uh, program that uh, doesn't interact with the user while compressing or decompressing a file or something of that sort. So, with two levels, we can, or the operating system, can use a different scheduling algorithm in each level. So, for example, in the foreground level or the interactive level, it may use round robin, while in the background level, it may use <coughs> first come, first serve. Now, why does this uh, choice here make sense? Why does it make sense to use round robin in the foreground and for first come first served in the background? What if we do for first come first served in the foreground? Does that make sense? It definitely doesn't make sense to do first come first served in the. Uh, in the foreground, because in the foreground you need a scheduling algorithm that supports or that uh, that properly schedules uh, interactive processes. And the the best algorithm for interactive processes is round robin. When you have uh, uh, multiple interactive processes, the best algorithm is round robin because it will give each process a time slice. So all processes will get time slices, and no process will have to wait for a long time. So this choice here uh, makes sense. Now with this scheme, the multi-level queue scheme, uh, priorities are fixed. So once a process has high priority, it will stay, uh, the priority will stay forever. And once a process has low priority, that will stay forever. This is unrealistic, by the way. We will see that uh, real operating systems do not do that. In fact, real operating systems implement the next algorithm, which is multi-level but with feedback, with uh, prior priorities changing. But here, what we're describing here, we're describing an algorithm in which priorities uh, do not change. Yes? Why is first come, first serve a good 
choice for a background processes? Uh, because it, uh, it doesn't matter. It's not time critical. And uh, it's not interacting with, uh, with the user. So if a process takes a long time or waits for a long time, that, uh, uh, that should not be a big problem. At that point, does it matter which one you use to implement it? Since it doesn't matter, time isn't like a priority. Time is, so what do you mean it doesn't so matter? As but in the order in which things get done isn't an as big an emphasis as it is in the foreground? Because in the foreground, we're using round robin because we want to give that impression of uh, like inter better user interaction. But in the background, if that's not as big of a, an issue, why can't we just use any, any, any algorithm? algorithm? Yeah. Well, what will happen if we use round robin in the background? Does it make, for example, does it make sense to use round robin in the background? You won't notice, right? Well, why isn't it a good idea? Yes. Uh, there's more overhead in my Yeah, so there is more overhead. The round robin means more system intervention and wasting more time in context switching. So if you use round robin in the background, you are wasting too much time in context switching, and there is no reason to pay that price if these processes are not interacting with the user. But it makes sense to pay the context switching price for with interactive processes because you don't want the user to feel that the system is slow. So you care about responsiveness for foreground processes. That's why you use round robin with the, uh, the context switching overhead. While in the background, there's no reason to pay that price. <coughs> OK. So now with this well, system that we are describing, or with this scheduling algorithm that we are describing, priorities do not change. And obviously, when you have a priority-based scheduling algorithm and priorities do not change, what's the biggest problem there? Starvation. Yeah, starvation. If priorities do not change, then low priority or lower priority processes are going to starve. So <coughs> one solution here, well, a more realistic solution is uh, aging that we will see in the next algorithm. But Assuming that we do not change priorities, one solution is to uh, divide the CPU time between foreground and background processes, give 80% of the CPU time to, around, uh, to foreground processes, and 20% say given to background processes. Uh, okay. Yeah, so this is an example of uh, you know different uh, levels of priority that the system may have. System processes are have the highest priority. Then user interactive processes have the second highest priority. Then interactive editing processes. Then batch uh, processes uh, have the lowest priority. And here we are putting student processes at the lowest priority. And I think this is. It's just uh, they're trying to tease students, <laughs> I guess. Uh, okay, multi-level feedback. Now this is the the more realistic or the most realistic scheduling algorithm among the ones that we are studying here. So it's multi-level. We have multiple queues, and each queue has its own level, and each queue has its own scheduling algorithm. But now the priorities change. So this is, this is dynamic and adaptive. And, it, and it's based on feedback. Feedback, what do we mean by feedback here? We mean that the system uh, adjusts the priority of a process based on its behavior. So this is the feedback. So the system may assign a priority in the beginning to a process, any priority, maybe high priority. But then, based on the behavior of the process, the system will adjust that. So it may promote a process or demote a process. So we have the notion of promotion, promotion and demotion.
promotion and demotion. Now there are two conditions for promotion that we need to understand. The first condition for promoting a process or increasing the priority level of a process is shorter CPU bursts. So if the system detects that the process has shorter CPU bursts, it's going to raise its priority. It will, give it, it will move it to a higher priority level. Now, why is that? So this is something that we need to understand very well. Why? Why does this make sense? Minimize the waiting time. What's that? <laughs> Minimize the waiting time. Minimize the waiting time. So this is basically a way of implementing the shortest job first. So this is how a real operating system implements the shortest job first principle. And so one way of thinking of this is, this is shortest job first. Another way of thinking of this is that we're giving higher priority to processes that are more interactive. So shorter CPU burst means a more interactive process. Shorter CPU burst means more interactive. Why shorter? Because sh shorter CPU burst means that a process is requesting I.O. more frequently. And a process, an interactive process, is going to be requesting I.O. frequently to interact with the user. Now, this also makes sense from, uh, from uh, the point of view of overlapping CPU and I.O. So, if we consider two processes, process number one with a long CPU burst, then it requests I.O. And process number two with a short that has a short CPU burst then it requests I.O. <coughs> now, and these two processes are in the ready queue. Of course, you know, these CPU burst lengths are estimated or predicted CPU burst lengths based on the process's history, based on the history. So this is estimated or predicted. Now, if the system gives the CPU to <coughs> process number one first, then process number two will be waiting for a long time. Right? While if it gives it to P2 first, P1 will not be waiting for a long time. And <coughs> while P2 is getting serviced by I.O., P1 will be on the CPU. So we will have a schedule like this. We will have, this is the CPU. And this is I.O. OK. So on the CPU, we will have P2. Then P2 is going to request I.O. very quickly. So most likely, P2 is not going to use its entire time quantum. By the way, generally speaking, an interactive process or a process with shorter CPU bursts uh, is, not, is not going to use its entire time quantum. It's going to request I.O. before the time quantum expires. So basically, processes that use the entire time quantum are processes with uh, longer CPU bursts. So P2 is going to request I.O. So now the kernel is in charge. So the kernel is going to put <coughs> P2 or to send P2's request to I.O. So P2 is now getting serviced by I.O. Then it's going to give the CPU to P1. So now the good thing, this is, <coughs> the good thing about this schedule is that within a short period of time, we have two processes making progress at the same time. P1 is making progress on the CPU. 
and P2 is making progress on IO. Okay? So this is, that's why the system will always favor a process with a shorter CPU burst. Now this is one, uh, one reason for promoting a process. Now can you think of another reason for promoting a process? Raising the priority level of a process. Okay, so if we just do this, if we promote a process when it has a, short, a shorter CPU burst and demotion, demotion, we demote a process if it has longer CPU bursts. What will happen if we just do this? Yeah. Starvation? Yeah, starvation, exactly. That's the problem. So how do we solve this problem? Yeah. Uh, promotion based on time waiting. Yeah, exactly. So here, to solve this problem, to avoid starvation, we promote a process that has been waiting for a long time. So as the process waits longer in the ready queue, we will boost the priority. So we will move it to a, a higher priority, priority level. Otherwise, it may starve. So if a process, if the nature of a process is uh, is not interactive and the process has longer CPU bursts, uh, it, sh it should be given lower priority, but it shouldn't stop. We don't want it to stop. So, aging. If a process ages, spends a long time in the queue, then we promote it. Okay, so this is very much what real operating systems do. Now let's look at this specific example and trace a specific uh, process. Now this is an example with three levels of priority. Level one is Q0, in which the system uh, applies the round-robin algorithm with a time quantum of eight milliseconds. Level one, round-robin with a time quantum of 16, and level two, first come, first serve. <coughs> okay. Now, uh, this is in a strict priority based system where if, uh, if I have a process in Q0, if there is a process in, the, uh, in Q0, none of the processes in Q1 and Q2 will get to execute. So processes here will execute only if this level is empty. And processes in this queue will execute only if both levels, 0 and 1, are empty. So this is strict priority, which means that if we don't do aging, many processes are going to start. But aging will move processes up in the uh, priority uh, hierarchy. Okay. And this is also preempted. So if a high priority process arrives, it's going to preempt lower priority processes. So let's say that uh, a job or a process arrived, and this process has enters the queue, and the system will first put it in Q0. So the system, the system will have to come up with a way of uh, you know, a certain uh, level that will put that it will put new processes in. And let's say the system put it in Q0. Then in Q0 it will give it eight milliseconds, an eight millisecond time quantum. Now if the process exhausts the eight seconds or it uses the entire eight, second, eight millisecond time slice, this means that the process has a long CPU burst. Uh, using the entire time quantum means to the system that this process has long CPU bursts, which means that the system is going to demote it. So it's going to put it in Q1 because it has, uh, this process has longer CPU bursts. So it will put it in Q1, and in Q1, <coughs> it, uh, you know, process may or may not get to execute when it's in Q1, depending on whether Q0 is empty or not, but suppose that, assume that at some point Q0 is empty, because say 
uh, you know, all high priority processes are waiting for I.O. Like the, the high priority processes are not ready at some point because they're waiting for I.O. and Q0 is empty. So processes in Q1 will get to execute. And that process is in Q1 and the system gives it 16 milliseconds. Now, if it uses these 16 milliseconds completely, this means that the, the CPU bursts are even longer, that it has very long CPU bursts. So in this case, the system will demote it further and it will put it in Q2. So it will basically um, you know, classify the process as a batch process, as opposed to an interactive uh, process. Okay. But with aging, uh, you know, a process <coughs> will not stay in Q2 forever. Because eventually, it will spend enough time to get promoted to Q1. Then, and if it doesn't get CPU time when it's in Q1, it's going to get promoted eventually to Q0, and it will be given another chance. And then, its demotion will depend on its CPU bursts. So if its CPU bursts are uh, long, then it will get demoted again. Okay, so any questions? So this is, <coughs> this scheme, this is the most realistic scheduling algorithm that we study here, and it's similar to what real operating systems do. Yeah. Uh, so part of the um, uh, system time is going to be sorting those queues um, as priorities change and stuff like that, I take it then? And that's going to be handled by kernel time, right? Yeah, so if it's, it's well, sorting the processes within the queues, so each yeah. queue. Yeah, yeah. So definitely, the uh, you know the system has its own data structures, okay. and it has to uh, uh, the system has to use efficient data structures for this, right? You know, like a priority queue, for example. Yeah. And uh, so it's uh, and that's what you know, that's part of the system time, the kernel time, and uh, you know scheduling uh, must be uh, done efficiently in an operating system because the ske the scheduler gets invoked very frequently. So it's one of the critical uh, sections of an, well, uh, the, the critical parts of the operating system. Yeah, the time critical. Uh, okay, so now we talk about thread. Uh, so if an operating system supports threads, like you know, all modern general purpose operating systems, they, uh, you know, like Windows and Linux and uh, uh, the Mac OS, they all support threading. In this case, scheduling will be done at the thread level. So the system will be scheduling threads, not processes. And <clears throat> there are two approaches to thread processing. There is the process contention scope and the system contention scope. With process contention scope, uh, Threads within the same process will be competing for the CPU with threads within the same process and will not be competing with threads in other processes. So, so there is a competition at the process level. Processes compete with processes. And threads within a given process compete with threads within that process. While with system contention scope, it's a flat system where it's a competition across uh, a system-wide competition across uh, a system-wide comp uh, competition uh, among all threads in the system. And in fact, in, in the pthread APIs, there are ways of <coughs> setting the contention scope. Well, setting and get. So let's see. Uh, you know, this is a sample code that, uh, that's similar to what we have seen in the code for creating threads. And if you did assignment two, you should be familiar with this. Uh, so remember that attribute. So there is the thread ID and there is the attribute uh, data structure. And when we, pre when we introduced the attribute data structure, we said that, among other things, this attribute data structure has some 
scheduling related attributes. And one of these scheduling related attributes is the contention scope. And there is a function that takes an attribute object and extracts the contention scope. So when you do init, this is going to set the attributes to the default. And if you are interested in finding out what the default in your system is, you use pthread attribute get scope. It will extract the scope. And then you will get to see what that is, and you will get to print it. Like if it's pthread scope process, it's a process contention scope. If it's pthread scope system, it's system contention scope. And you can print it. And so this is something that you can do. This is a, a quick experiment that you can do using your code for assignment two. And you can also set the contention scope. So you can say pthread attribute set scope that will set the contention scope to either uh, system or uh, process. And you, know, you can try this with assignment two uh, and see if this can make any uh, difference in performance. 